thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, if you guys have been on our webinars before, you'll see this is obviously a much different format than what we normally do. Uh, we're doing this in more of a panel discussion um, uh, podcast style right now. Currently, um, we're only hosting it on YouTube and our website at the moment, but we will, uh, as we expand this platform a little bit more, um, we'll try to do a little bit more with it. Um, but today we are joined by Jeff, Will, and Tanner. Why don't we go around and say a little quick hello. I'm going to start with Will. Um, Will, can you let us know who you are, what you do, where you're from, and if you were not a ServiceNow uh, professional expert, what would you be doing? Yeah, so uh, William Smith, um, I've been doing ServiceNow for going on eight years now, and uh, developer certified, got all the all the certifications there. So. If I wasn't doing service now, um, I would hopefully be an Air Force pilot. Uh, so long as as long as these things can work, so that's my only downfall. Kind of blind. Are you from Ohio? Here. Ohio. I'm from Ohio. Lived, born, raised, all that. So mm -hmm. spent some time in Phoenix, Arizona. But what's that? I said I spent some time in Phoenix, Arizona, in the Air Force. But other than that, I've pretty much been in Ohio all my life. Beautiful Ohio. Tanner, mm -hmm. same questions. Hey everybody, same questions. I'm Tanner Kibler. I'm a technical consultant. I am based out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I'm going to try my very best to keep this like southern drawl in check for the course of this, but I can't make any guarantees. Um, and if I weren't a service now expert, what would I be? I would probably be, I don't know, I'd want to teach. Hmm. want to teach. Like at, at the collegiate level though, you know, not not young kids whose minds I could shape, but like, you know, defined people that have already made up their minds. All right, very good. Jeff? Hey, I'm Jeff Pierce. I'm the Portal Practice Manager at Cerna. I've been building portals and custom apps on service now for a little over eight years. I live in Honolulu, Hawaii. And if I was not a service now developer, I would uh, ideally do something that didn't involve computers at all. Um, <laughs> maybe be a, a jazz ukulele musician in the uh, in the tiki bars around Hawaii. Oh yeah, that old, you know, like you do <laughs> on the weekends. <laughs> that old thing. Um, that old thing. It was one or the other. I mean, it was it was a you always have to pick one between those two. Um, either it's just my day job with my night job. Sure. Yeah. So um, just to explain the format a little bit, normally what we do is if you have a question, um, still you know throw it out as soon as it comes into your head, and we usually uh, answer it at the end. This time, don't do that. Answer uh, still answer. Uh, I'm sorry. Ask your question right away. Um, but we're going to try to answer them during the discussion as it's relevant. So we are going to be changing topics a little bit here and there, uh, and we don't want your question to be missed um, as we move to another topic. So if we have time, we'll definitely get to that. One question we get very often is, will this be recorded? And obviously it will. It's a podcast. So uh, as I mentioned before, we will be posting this on our website, on YouTube, and anyone who's registered or attended will be getting a uh a recording sent to you uh, by email. So take a look for that. But right now we're gonna jump to our first topic, uh, brain teaser. Can you guys see my screen okay? Mm -hmm. yes, yep. Damn, right there. There. Um, so is Service Portal really a portal anymore? And Jeff, do you wanna go into a little bit just real quickly about what you mean there? Sure. So what is a portal? Uh, you know, traditionally, Portal is door, window, something into another uh, another world. Um, once Yahoo came along, suddenly we had uh, a, a portal was a, an extremely ugly website loaded with links to other places. Um, and then along comes ServiceNow with, with CMS, and it's a, again, a, a portal. You know, you've got an iframe-based uh, experience where these iframes are windows into the the native UI of ServiceNow. Um, so I guess, you know, that's traditionally what a portal is. I is, is do you guys have the same understanding? Like when you hear the word portal, what, what do you think of? Stargate. Stargate. Yeah. Portal to another universe. Yeah. I think we were all thinking about Stargate. Let's just admit that. <laughs> a, a to B. I mean, the, the, video, the video game comes to mind for me, you know, oh, yeah. yellow or orange and blue. Oh, that is good. You know, um, but I mean, 
technically or in a technology sense i always think of like a you know the old intranet sites that were just big lists and pages of links and that's kind of what i think of when i think of a portal yeah yeah i think cms was a true portal mostly mm -hmm. because of the iframes right just like the video game you're just creating a window where you're looking at something else exactly as it is right you 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 can you know step through that into something else keep one foot in, in in the front end one foot in the back end but service portal do you think that's truly a portal anymore without the iframes no do not believe so no definitely not. i mean just the, the the fact that it's based on angular js and and what do you call an angular js thing that you make you call it an application an app right, spa, an, right. An yeah, so now I think we're, we're to the point where you can't separate the back end, you know, the data and the content that you're serving, you, you can't separate that with the front end because now with, with AngularJS, we can build such a robust user experience that, um, you know, it, it's not a portal anymore. You're not stepping through to, you know, another view or anything like that. We're actually just, just using data from the server and presenting it in a um, you know a very unified, succinct way, and uh, with, with I mean it's an application all in itself. I mean, it's no longer a portal; it's service application in, in a way, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever would you, you would call it. I don't. Tell me if my analogy is way off. Would you say that the uh, a portal is to a telephone as um, service portal is to a smartphone in the sense that a telephone basically has the one function but your smartphone is also a calendar and a camera and all these things that work together is that sort of the difference you're trying to clarify i think that's a pretty fair comparison um you know you still got the the main function of connecting one voice to another uh but you're right it's a whole lot more and we don't really even we still call it a phone, but do you even use it as a phone anymore? <laughs> no. Very rarely. It's probably the least used function of your phone is the phone. Right. <laughs> I hate so, calling. Yeah. Text me. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're right. That's actually probably a, a really a fair like uh, uh, example. Is that you know it, it's become an experience in itself. You're, you're not just going you know portaling to another place. You're um, you know, all of, all of your application logic, your user experience is, is all is all in the, the Angular application, and we're just borrowing the data, not necessarily views from the back end, just the data. So, yeah, so I don't know, what would we call it now? If it, if it wasn't Service Portal, what would be a more appropriate name? Ooh. I don't know. I think you've got to stick with Service Portal. It's just for the nostalgia? Just for nostalgia purposes. You don't yeah. think service application makes more sense for you? Or is that is that not, since we're, we're saying it's more of an application than a portal? I think that's I think hard to distinguish with the rest of service. Platform. It's not distinct yeah. enough. Well, and I think application is, application is kind of limiting too, right? I mean, because yeah. application makes me think that it does one thing. Yep. Uh -huh. And it doesn't have to do one thing. It could do anything. Right. And it can do multiple things on one page. Yep. I guess that's why yeah. we still call phones phones, right, Jeff? Yeah, it's still a phone. We still call it still a portal. Portal, portal. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's take a little bit more of a, a deep dive uh, into something that you were talking about before about how this really is dependent on the experience that you're you're going through, um, and part of what is going to dictate that experience is going to be a company's specific company's culture by which we're not necessarily specifically referring to multiculturalism or, or you know, uh, from other nations, but the specific, specific subculture within a, uh, an organization or a business. How do you feel that an organization's culture impacts portal design? And one thing I'm going to do real quick, I'm going to jump to uh, kind of one of the points I know that we wanted to get to first. Um, Jeff, could you go into what you, uh, you know, something you talked about with the six dimensions of organizational culture, and maybe we can let that sort of steer this conversation, how you want to move forward there. Yes, yeah, so, so you, know you all know my good friend, Geert. <laughs> oh, Geert. Geert, Geert yeah. Geert. Good old granddaddy Geert. Yeah, so Geert Hofstede, I have no idea who he is other than he 
he developed the six dimensions of organizational culture. And I, I, I think he's pretty spot on with, with it. I mean, some of these overlap a little bit, but let's let's go through each one of them and and maybe give an example of of how this dimension could have an impact on how we design our, our applications or our portals. So the first one is individualism versus collectivism. So that is, um, uh, you know, that can be described in, in the concept of, you know, how willing are, are people to share knowledge, how, how much of a, a group do people feel, you know, how, how, how important is teamwork versus individual achievements, things like that. I don't know, how could, what do you think? Depending on, on where an organization falls in, in there, how could that impact portal design? I think it would impact a lot of content. So I think that a company that practices more along lines of collectivism, so so teamwork and cooperation, would be more likely to have, you know, things like my group's work, you know, my group's progress, you know, not not necessarily my progress. How is my team doing? How's my department doing? As opposed to how am I doing? Yeah. So so there there's one feature of ServiceNow that comes to mind that I don't see anybody use. Do you guys know what I, I might be referring to that, that might be relevant to this? Social Q&A. Okay. Or what used to be live stream. Yeah. Right? I, I, you know, that's one thing where like, when I demo it, everybody's like, hmm, that looks interesting. <laughs> but when it comes down to it, they're like, no, we don't want people helping each other. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get it because on one hand, you don't want to somebody from accounting giving IT advice to, you know, somebody in another department, right? But but it the, the certainly is something to be aware of. It's like, okay, how much do we share knowledge? Or maybe if, if that's not the way, you know, like do, do people at least share knowledge of how to do their job with other people? You know, I worked at a place, it was a factory where everybody was just like so protective of their, their knowledge and their skill set because if they were afraid if if anyone else knew how to do their job, then they would take their job. And, you know, that was a very short-sighted attitude and, you know, very close-minded. Um, but so like social q and I think that's one. Um, like what, what else do you think about like content and in what way does that impact content? You mean social q and or in general? Or no, just in general, like individual versus collectivism. If you did have an organization who who placed a lot of value on sharing information and, and, and increasing the skill sets of everybody, teaching other people what you know, how, how could that uh, be fostered? I know? think that would help, you know, the entire organization because, you know, the mm -hmm. more that you can step in and help somebody when they're out on leave or they, you know, take a couple weeks off to be with their family, that kind of thing, you know, that, that helps everybody and builds up the entire organization as opposed to, you know, like your factory scenario where it's yeah. just, you know, I do my thing and I only work with widget A and widget B. And if, if somebody tries to take my widget, then, you know, I'm gonna raise a fuss. Yeah, yeah. I think that locking knowledge down very rarely benefits really anyone. Uh, open sharing of knowledge is key. Yeah, so transparency of the knowledge base, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what about, uh, okay, the next dimension, power distance. So this is to the degree or the degree to which people feel distance between them, their, their own position and the next level of, of power. So like, how, what is the distance between managers, you know, who has a, a authority to do what, or who, you know, who is leading? Um, what, what do you think there? How, how does that impact service management and portal design? Think so is power distance like, you know, how much can I joke around with my boss and how, you know, how comfortable do I feel working with my boss on a project kind of thing? I think that's part of it. Also, like, what do I have authority to do? Like, what kind of decisions yeah. can I make for myself mm -hmm. or for my team or yep. the, the direction that my work is headed in? Do I always like, have to be told what to do versus go and seek out work? Yeah. So I, I think of two things come to mind. One is how do I get assigned work, right? Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to like just manage a queue on my own and take the work that I 
think is relevant uh, or, you know, that I, I think I can handle well, or um, say like approvals. Are, are there very stringent approvals on everything or am I allowed to order a new keyboard from the service catalog without having it to, you know, go through my manager and my manager's manager, you know, stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Or even maybe even visibility of what your team has requested. Mm -hmm. Things like that, you know, if, even if you're not the manager. Um, all right, the next one, uh, masculinity versus femininity. And this, of course, has nothing to do with what gender you actually are. Um, this is just, you know, the, the attitude, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, you could fall into the masculine or, or, or feminine side. So this is, so like traditionally masculinity is results oriented. Uh, femininity is more experience oriented or competitive versus cooperative. Um, and I think this, this also kind of overlaps with the individualism versus collectivism a bit too. But can you think of anything that, uh, you know, might might change in our, our portal design based upon where an org falls in that? I think it a lot of it comes down to, you know, language and verbiage and how you, you know, how you create simple things like labels, right? I mean, mm -hmm. are they, soft and gentle and they're you know questions or are they kind of more hard and rigid and it's just give me the answer uh -huh. the thing that jumps to my mind is is search you know mm. do we want to take a, a I, I don't know how to phrase this properly is it a process do they type something in and get you know this knowledge base do they, do they get a whole page of results that can be further filtered or does it is it results oriented to your point where it only hits a certain number of finite things and you get a much shorter list but perhaps has a higher relevancy that yeah. comes to my mind yeah you know i heard it described kind of once where you know the masculine uh method of conversation is just one rope and you tie knots like you talk about this you tie it then you move down and then you talk about the next one and then you talk mm -hmm. about the next one uh, whereas uh, a more feminine oriented conversation is going to be like a web where we'll talk about this and we'll go over here and we'll go over here and we'll circle back to this and you know what i mean it's like a, it's a much less linear and i think that's kind of what you're talking about tanner it is like when i come into the portal do i want a very linear approach i click this button i go to the form i get my submission confirmation message boom i'm done or do i want to get suggestions of other content i might be interested in do i want to see related knowledge articles you know things like that so i think that's um, that is a better phrased version of exactly my sentimentality. <laughs> I've heard a similar analogy, um, and it's actually a book. It's called Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti. And it's kind of that same mentality of makes you hungry. But, yeah, men kind of fit into, you know, boxes, and women are like spaghetti, and they're kind of, but. <laughs> the, 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 uh, okay. You got to read the book. I, my, I should not say <laughs> Read the book if you want more. All right. I gotta catch up my reading. Guys. All right, next one: uncertainty, avoidance. The degree to which people tolerate ambiguity. Now, I, I think of like a scientific lab. La, la, I was gonna say scientific Labrador. Scientific <laughs> uh, versus a like a Silicon Valley tech firm, right? Uh, you know, two very different cultures. Uh, so how will that? How might that? make a difference in, in what we design an app or portal. I think verbosity would come into play there. Do you want to have a, a, a label that is 15 words long describing exactly what this does, or are you happy with two words and an icon? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the prime example. Icon Iconography versus text. Yeah. Yeah, your, your, your scientists and doctors, they're not going to be happy with, with icons because it's just, like, I want to know exactly what that icon is supposed to represent if, if you want me to click on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, let's, let's go to the next. Uh, Long-term versus short-term orientation. Um, so I think this is also kind of bleeds into the others. Um, you know, is our, our focus of work and achievement uh, long-term or are we... Well, not to be too redundant, but short term. What, what do you think? What's What's an example of that? When you say that you know, obviously, no one's no one's building a portal 
for the next three weeks. You know, they're, they're, the idea is that they're using this tool for a while. What is this, an example of how it would be short term and long term? Um, well, this, this might come into play with the, uh, the, the type of news and announcements that you have in your portal. You know, how, how far out in advance are you announcing things that might be happening, like planned maintenance? Um, or, you know, things that are, are new services that are coming down the line in the future. Uh, that, that might be one example, you know, where you're filled with, you know, if I come to the portal and I can get a great overview of, of, of where this service organization is headed, you know, what I can expect to see a month from now. Or is this all about just, you know, just, I need to submit something right now. Give me the status of it. Only put in front of me what's important to me at this moment. Um, I think that that could be, I don't know, what do you think? To shake things up and, and, you know, not totally shake things up, but not so much design as it is implementation of Portal, I think that plays into a lot of this too. Because if you have a short-term mindset and you know that you have a long-term goal, you have a three-year goal, you're not there yet, you're not going to hold on to that for three years. Roll it up incrementally. Make your changes incrementally have that progress in the short term eventually hit your long-term goal yeah well, yeah and I, I think is this something you've run into as well and something that you've uh had to find a solution for sorry was that to me yeah sorry um so yeah i mean i would say that um it, i think there are definitely uh times where i've encountered this it not necessarily in portal design, but just kind of in, in general, you know, when, when working with clients that, you know, we, um, just to get them to kind of focus on, you know, what the long-term effects of the decisions that are that are being made, right? Just to kind of look at things in, a, in more of a long-term manner. Think about, you know, how, what you're, what you're gonna do for the next two weeks or month might affect decisions that are made a year from now, two years from now. Sure. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think Tanner, you're exactly right that this isn't just about how the portal is designed or like what it looks like or how it's used, but how, what's the approach to actually building it? So, mm -hmm. so what do you guys think? Do you think agile or waterfall uh, or which one of the two is long-term, which one is, is short-term? Well, they both have long-term affectations. I think Agile is better short term. It's better suited short term. You've got your shorter sprints. I don't think Waterfall really works for this kind of project. And that's just my opinion. That's just me. But I think too much emphasis could be put up front on design and it could really slow you down a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, when we work with stakeholders and product owners, I think sometimes they they take a look at Agile and be like, what, multiple releases? We're only going to do a little bit at first, and then, you know, this is going to be an right. ongoing project. That seems that seems too long-term to them. We're like, yeah. no, let's do it. waterfall, let's just get this over with. Boom, bang, done. You know, but but I think that's a mis misconception because I think Agile, even though it's a continual, you know, release approach where you're actually working on it longer, it's actually right. more of a short-term orientation because it's like, no, just give us something that works yeah. right now. Whereas yeah, you waterfall, have to work faster. Even yeah, you though have to you want to with the right, waterfall uh, project work. sooner, you're like, you're expecting to use that for a long time now. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so last one, indulgence versus restraint. So where is the gratification in the user experience? Is it in future success um, uh, or is it like here, right now i guess what i mean by future success is, is you know am i looking to to the end result as, as all my gratification like i'm not going to be satisfied until i see my incident resolved and completed in my you know in my tickets list or am i going to be gratified throughout the entire experience when i click on the button is there a little sound that it makes Doo -doo -doo, you know <laughs> like I'm, like I'm already feeling happy about this you know <laughs> well, I, kind of, I kind of think about it in a different manner of of the design, right? So we're talking about portal design. So this reminds me of, you know, with let's go back to the agile versus waterfall, right? With waterfall, I've got one big hurrah at the end of my project and it's amazing. But with agile, right, 
you, you get those those short little bursts and you get yeah. you know, much more instant feedback and much more um, a higher level of, you know, of indulgence or, you know, let's use that word, of, you know, gratification, right? So you get gratification at the end of every sprint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think if you have an organization that is indulgent and, it, and you can mm -hmm. pretty consistently interpret that as maybe like a younger user group, right? You know, our, our millennials, the smartphone users, you know, people who grew up with the internet, they're going to be much more indulgent and they're going to expect a much more gratifying experience from the moment they they come to your portal homepage to to the end of you know their their ticket cycle or whatever um whereas if it isn't a very indulgent organization you don't have to worry about those bells and whistles or you know put less of a focus on those um well that's it that's that's geared hostie six dimensions of, of organizational culture and well, of course you know you could talk about so when, when you go into a, a project, do you then simply identify the culture of this organization is masculine or feminine, or do you identify that they are long-term versus short-term and then design the portal to fit that mold? Or do you kind of pick and choose elements of each to suit that culture? Very good question. So um, a very important step in application design, whether it's portal or not, is the user profile. And don't think that you're just gonna create one user profile. You're gonna create user profiles for every type of user. Um, you know, so the things you wanna understand about the user is, uh, you know, what's their experience with, with, uh, with web applications? What type of devices do they use? Where are they when they are consuming the, the services uh, of the portal? Um, you know, what's, do, do they get frustrated easily? And you know, ask questions about these six different dimensions to to see where this user falls. You know, are they indulgent? Are they, um, you know, are they more masculine or feminine in, in their approach to, um, to to how they work? Uh, you know, so uh, so we want to identify all of these things, get a very good understanding of of who this user is, and then we define all of our use cases. Uh, in terms of that user. So when we write the stories as a uh, so-and-so, I want to do this so that I can do this. Now we actually have users that we can fit in there. Hmm. Um, and that has a major impact on, on the design because if you've got two different kinds of users, you know, one, say one group that is very technical and, and one that, that is not very technical, you know, they, they barely have to, to get on a computer for their job. Um, you can't expect to just give them the, the, the same portal and, and a, you know expect them to fit in. I mean, they can use the same portal, but you're going to have to consider how one group is going to, uh, you know, have different needs than another. So, you know, that's where you know, like, you may have more advanced uh, list reporting abilities or more advanced search capabilities that are that are optionally available. Right. The, the, the first experience is very simple and, and straightforward. You know, like a, a very simple web app. But then you have options to where if you are more, um, you know, technical uh, or, you know, ha have the personality where you, you want to browse around more, you also have those options, but those are you know, more extra and not really the main features. Sure. Sure. Great. So what I want to do real quick is uh, we need to shift gears a little bit. I want to give everyone a heads up. Uh, we haven't gotten a lot of questions come through on this discussion, but if uh, you guys are going to have questions, um, this next portion is probably where you want to get ready to ask those. We're going to go ahead and do just kind of a quick uh, take a look right now um, at uh, some of Jeff's own tips and tricks for setting up a service portal for what kind of the multicultural business that we were talking about, being able to translate across a, a variety of, uh, of businesses. Yeah, so, you know, originally our, our topic here, uh, we're going to show, you know, several techniques for uh, translating service portals. Um, kind of what we, what we realized was that, um, or at least what I realized is that largely I, I was solving for an issue that, that didn't exist because, you know, we already have some really easy ways of, of translating. Um, and I was kind of making it more complicated, but we did, we did find one, um, uh, very interesting use case where, uh, you could not use the traditional, uh, translation methods to, to translate a message. So, so for example, 
like you may, everybody may be familiar with this, right? Putting a, uh, a message key in this notation, dollar sign curly brackets, uh, will we'll go retrieve this message key from your messages table and translate it, and then your, your translation will, will show here. Um, now, if you also wanted to do that in your client script, let's say, here, let's close this down here. Let's say I wanted to use a variable there. Um, so C modal button label, something like that. Over here, I can define that C dot modal button label equals and then I can do that same exact thing, but I got to do it as a string, right? So uh, you know, I, I could do that. So there's you know, nothing profound, <laughs> nothing unique I have to offer with that. But we thought of a, um, this other use case, which is the, the dynamic uh, message. Um, so, so credit to Chuck Tomasi, he wrote an article out on the developer forum about the uh, the second parameter of, of GS.getMessage. And um, so we're thinking, all right, what is a, a clever way that we could kind of streamline doing that method here in Service Portal? And um, we worked on it for quite a while to find an ideal solution, and I think we got it. Um, so if you're not familiar with, with that method, um, here in, in the server script, or in any server script, anywhere that you could use gs.getMessage. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with that, I'll just show you how that would work. So I'm gonna do our, our get message call, uh, pass it a key. So we'll say that was pop modal. Now we can also pass that another set of, uh, or another parameter. Um, let's just call it, uh, call it values. And values would be an array of values. So let's say I'm going to just pass my name and pass a ticket number. I'm just hard coding these. You know, we don't have time to, to get all this stuff dynamically. Um, so what would happen then is in my message now, with, with passing it the key and this array of values, um, we can build a message like this. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, so let's say, so pop modal was our key. And uh, so now we can say, I, and I'm gonna grab the first value from the values array. And then I can grab the second value. So those are the index numbers of, of those values. So this is how you can create a dynamic message. You know, otherwise you would have to create two different messages, one with hi, one with your ticket number is, and then you know had to you know splice it all together. Um, so so this is what we're gonna to demonstrate here is how you can can create a, a reusable um, method so that you can easily do this throughout Service Portal. So first of all, let's um, let's build out the rest of our um, our, our controller here. So we're going to leave uh, the template just as it is. It's just a simple button on a page. I already have this page set up right here. So we got a button, pop modal. Um, let's go ahead and just change this back to pop modal. Um, pop modal. All right, now let's build our client script. Now, we're actually not going to do anything with the server script, so we're just going to close that down. Because the idea is we wanted a method that could easily be injected into any, any widget without having to do things both in the client script and the server script. Okay, so first, uh, let's, let's get our, um, let's define our, our variables that we're going to pass to the, uh, to this method. So here, I'll call it vars. Um, I'm going to go to the root scope. Actually, I'm not we need to inject root scope here into our controller. And uh, so there's a user object in the, in the root scope where we can get the first name of the, the current user. And then I'm just going to pass this uh, a, a static ticket number. You know, you could, 
you know, there are many ways to, to make this part dynamic when you submit a ticket. But we don't have time for that today. All right, uh, so I've created a service called Portal Messages. We've got that ready to go in, uh, attached to this uh, for the sake of time. I created that ahead of time. And uh, so what we want to do is, um, all right, here, let's create our, um, our modal function. So when I click this button, it's going to call us pop modal. And that's going to call this function. So inside of there, we're just going to do a few things. Um, here, first, let's inject timeout. And I'll tell you why we need that in a minute. So inside a timeout function, we, um, yeah, get a little ahead of myself. Let's just do this to start with. Um, actually, here I already have a message entered for this, so we'll leave the title. Uh, but the message for now, let's just make it static. Uh, and we'll just test to make sure this is working so far. Just a quick refresh. I expect a, a modal to pop up. And it didn't. Why not? Let's see, pop modal. Oh, because I did not inject SP modal. I plan to use SP modal. Got to inject it to your controller. All right, so here's our confirmation message. And we want this to be a dynamic message, right? Instead of just high. All right, so let's, um, let's build uh, the... So, so thinking about how are we going to use that gs.get message, because that has to happen server side, right? Um, so we can use a scripted REST API for that. Uh, I've gone ahead and created one already. It's just a, uh, a post uh, REST message called it get dynamic message. Um, well, this is actually uh, what we're looking at right now is, is the resource of the get dynamic message REST resource or REST API. Um, so our, our script for that is going to be really simple. So we're going to get the, uh, the message key from the, re the request body data. We're going to use gs.get message to pass the key and the values. So you can see the key is actually going to be an object. Uh, and then we'll just, you know, we're going to set the body to, to, to the result of that. Uh, so this is going to return an object with uh, our message key and then that translated message. Uh, so all of this stuff, I'm, I'll post in a blog post afterwards. So uh, you don't have to worry about copying any of this down or, or like following along too closely right now. Uh, you know, you'll have access to these templates uh, later. Okay, so we're done with our REST message. Now we want to uh, check out our, our service that we created. So portal messages, this is an Angular provider service that I've attached to this widget. And what we're going to do in there is that's where we're going to call that, uh, that REST API. So we inject HTTP into the service. We define our, uh, we get our message object ready um, as, you know, with our properties that we're going to use. All right, so now everything in this return section is going to be accessed or accessible by any controller that injects this, this service, right? So we'll be able to call these functions. Um, so we've already injected the service here. Um, so let's take a look at what these do. First, let's look at this one, get dynamic message. Let's go ahead and call that one from our controller. So, um, so when we call the pop modal function, we'll do a timeout, meaning we're just going to, um, I'm sorry, this goes outside of the timeout. Okay, so portal messages, that's the name of our service get dynamic message, that's a function inside that service, right there, right? And we're gonna pass to it two things. One is the message key, 
So confirmation message. Oh, I should back up here. So like our use case here is, is providing a, a dynamic translatable confirmation message to a user like after they submit a ticket, right? So that's, that's kind of what we're, our, our example case here. So this is the key to the message that I'm, I'm going to use. And then vars, that's the, uh, the array of values that I want to uh, inject into this message. All right, so, so that's going to call this function where now data becomes an object with my key and my vars as properties. Here's my, my REST API. So there's the path to my scripted API. Um, here's HTTP post and we're just going to assign message or re assign the result to message. So I've already defined message up here as a global variable in this service. All right. So, so when I click the pop modal button, we're going to go and get that message via Rust API. Now, this might take a second for it to, to evaluate and come back. So we have to put it in a timeout function. If, um, if you don't, this is going to try to uh, to display your message before you had a chance to get it back from your API. Um, now you can uh, probably work with th th there might be a way to to use promises to to wait for that message. Um, we kind of ran out of time yesterday uh, figuring that out, so we just decided to use a timeout. I mean, the timeout is rather imperceptible. It's less than a second that we're waiting. Um, we're waiting 777 milliseconds. We figured that was a lucky number. Uh, Gotta be good. <laughs> all right. So what do we need now? So we've, we've got the message. Now we just need to, um, or that, that message is now stored in this variable in the service. So what can we do? We can call the get message function to create a reference to that object in our controller. So now C message, which is local to this controller, is now going to be a reference to this object because this function right here. We call get message and it returns that. All right. And so now, rather than this, we do C dot message and that's an object. And the property of that object, which contains the translated message, is message. Okie dokie. So let's give this a try. Somebody get the confetti gif ready. <laughs> what was that? Confetti we Freddy? We what? Confetti gif. Oh, confetti gif, yeah. All right. Oh, let me show you first the, um, the message that I already have. So that message with the confirmation key um, of confirmation message looks like this, which I kind of already showed. So hello, that's going to be my name. Your request number is this, and then we have you know the rest of it. So this can be translated into any language, right? And depending on the language, your variables might fall in different places, right? Uh, okay, so let's give it a try. Boom, there it is. Hello system. Well, that's my first name. I'm the system administrator. <laughs> um, your request number is this. So there you go. Now to reuse this, all you have to do is, uh, is inject this uh, service into any widget that, uh, that you want to um, use dynamic messages in. Uh, so you just inject the service. Then you use the service to, to call that, that REST API. You pass it a message key and some variables. Um, and then you use this where you want to um, actually use that message then. Da, da, da. Yeah, so you might not find this use case terribly relevant, but at least you can, uh, you know, we've demonstrated some, some interesting methods of using services and scripted REST API to do some, some more advanced uh, portal techniques. So hopefully you can find this useful and uh, maybe use this elsewhere. You say that Any comments? you're not sure this is super relevant, but I, I, I know we've talked to a lot of people where having multinational customers is a, a complication for them and having these kind of tricks and, and tips oh. is gonna be super important, right? 
Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely relevant. It's just, you know, usually when I demo stuff, I like to, to use very common problems. Mm. I just think this, this is one that's maybe not as common, but certainly still useful. Sure. Yeah. Any comments, Tanner or Will? I mean, we had a lot of fun yesterday trying to, to get this to work. Um, yeah, yeah, this was a, good, a, a good comment fun from, from our team real quick. Uh, they were wondering if this code is going to be available in a blog post. I think you, you said that just a little bit earlier that you are going to be posting this, uh, making this available to the attendees, correct? Yeah, yeah, I will, I'll get these, uh, these code templates uh, put up in a blog post. And uh, so just watch out on, on LinkedIn um uh for that we'll also uh put a link to that in uh in the youtube video when we post this yeah and it'll be sent to all of the attendees as well yeah yeah all really right. my only my only comment on that would be again it's an uncommon use case so if you're listening and you don't have this specific need take a look at the architecture of this and you might find that to be useful you know have your service your shared service and maybe an API that would prevent you from having to update the server script anytime you wanted to utilize this. Yeah, absolutely. And just remember, it's not enough just to inject it here. You actually have to go and attach this, this Angular provider uh, in the, the providers related list on the widget form. So it is kind of a two-step uh, method to, to inject a service into your widget. Um, Okay. All right. What do we got next? What's our next topic? All right, guys. Can you guys see my screen right now? Yes, sure do. All right. Okay. So uh, we are running a little bit longer. So anyone that is uh, still hanging on, we do appreciate that. Uh, obviously, we're having a, a fairly lively discussion. Uh, we hope you guys are enjoying and getting value out of that right now. Um, right now, the next topic before we wrap everything up is uh, wireframing everything and anything. And Jeff, I'm again going to pass that to you and kind of uh, ask again, what do you mean by that? Sure. Um, all right. So first, let me ask a, a trick question. Where are you when you wireframe? On the beach. Tennessee. <laughs> Tennessee. On the beach. In your basement. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the what I'm getting at is is actually where are you not when you wireframe? You in are. The CEO's office. What's that, Will? In the CEO's office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely not in the CEO's office. That's what like being called in the principal's office. <laughs> <laughs> right? No, you're not in front of a, a stakeholder. Yeah, no. Or maybe not even in front of the product owner. Right? right. Um, no, I mean, there, there could be arguments for, for doing that, especially like if you're just kind of spitballing. But yeah, wireframing is a creative process. That's mm -hmm. kind of a very personal process because in order to wireframe well, you got to start out ugly, right? You got to start just by by spewing ideas onto the page, and in that process, you will totally distract and and bend out of shape anybody who is is not familiar with this process. Yeah, so we'll, let's just do this. We'll just do a quick example of this very very quickly. Um, so I'm a strong believer in wireframing everything, whether it is a um, Oh, come on, what happened here? My, my balsamic just froze up. There we go. Um, whether you're just, uh, it's a form section, you know, just a few fields on a form or an entire portal. You, you got a wireframe first because that is the single most effective way that you can avoid having to rework things, right? Because what you want to do is you want to first show your product owner or whoever you're gathering requirements from um, a visual representation of the ideas you've talked about and a proposed solution. And it's so much faster to draw boxes on a page than to actually develop it, uh, develop a prototype. Um, you know, we have this very old school thought uh, way of thinking still very prominent in the industry of build me a prototype. I want to see what it could look like. And it takes a long time. It's very costly to build a prototype when you can build a wireframe that does the exact same thing practically, or, or at least demonstrates everything that you want. Um, and it can be done in a fraction of the time. So I use this tool, Balsamic Mockups. It's, um, 
Now it's like 80 bucks, but it's a one-time purchase, uh, but it's very simple to use, very easy to use. Uh, and I've been using it for two, almost eight years. Um, all right, so let's just do a, a very quick exercise. Will, Tanner, you're the product owners, and um, we're building a, a portal homepage. And, and you guys tell me your requirements. What, what does a user need to be able to do when they're on, on, in your portal? I want to see the weather. <laughs> Big, okay. bold. All right, so we're going to need... Oh, what is going on? Not I'm everybody gets to live in Hawaii and have, you know, 82 degrees every day. So I need yeah. to know if I'm going to have to wear a jacket or if I'm going to need an umbrella. You might not be familiar with this, Jeff, but the weather does change occasionally. <laughs> so it's good to know what it is right now. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> Sometimes stuff falls from the sky. It's called snow. Okay. All right. So we'll stop right here. If, if This is not enough to say, like, okay, we're going to have the weather on the page. Because right. there are more questions to ask here, right? Because if I step into a user's shoes and be like, all right, I'm going to check the weather. I have a blank box. Okay, what do I want to know about the weather? I need to be able to search for for townships, for counties, for country, whatever it may be, for the weather. Whoa, this, this requirement just got complex. All right. So search, uh, search townships so i also need a way to report an outage right so we'll stick with our weather theme if you know lightning has struck a pole and i've got an outage of you know a neighborhood so i need a way to report that to somebody oh so like weather outages mm -hmm. okay, so let's use the list i'm gonna need a list yep Actually, I think there's a table, one that would work better for that. A data grid, yeah. There we go. So, this would be weather-related outages. So, so, here's one, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we'll just keep the blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now weather, we thought maybe it was just gonna start out being the temperature up in the corner of the screen, but now it actually, we're gonna need a lot more. So maybe that can be an important part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the first thing you see. Um, we're gonna need a map as well. Can you, can you build us a map, please? Yeah. All right, so you guys do realize this is your portal homepage and we're already like using a good part of the the real estate for for weather um, i think that our our scenario our company is a local news station okay that makes sense in this scenario to have a lot for weather okay so do we have a so this is our our map all right so we're we're on time so maybe about five till the end of the hour just a Keeping okay. on. All right. So let's, uh, I think this is, we'll go ahead and, 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 and wrap this exercise at this. But I think, you know, the important things to take away from this is that, you know, we first heard a very simple requirement from our product owner, right? We want the weather on the page. We thought it was going to be enough to say, all right, it's 78 degrees Fahrenheit outside right now. And then as we actually started to say, well, here's what we propose, we found out that there's much more mm -hmm. to, to the story. Right, so, so, so this is, you know, if you're not wireframing, you are, you're, you're not working smartly, you're just working hard. Uh, so I encourage everybody to, you know, even if you don't have balsamic mockups, you can just do this with PowerPoint, you can do it out with a, a pen and a napkin, right? Just, just draw out the solution and show it to your product owner and be like, is this what you mean, right? Because then that's gonna create discussion, all right. Okay, so that's uh, that's wireframing. Um, our final topic here. This podcast was brought to you by Haiku Theory. If you don't know what Haiku Theory is, if you haven't had a chance to see it, maybe at the Knowledge Conference, or um, if, uh, if we've done a, several demos of this with, with 
group clients. Um, let's take a look at it now. So Haiku Theory is Cerna's service portal accelerator. So there, you know, I've been building portals for a long time and we've seen a lot of uh, the same challenges and, and needs arise uh, over the past eight years. Um, and, and one of the, the, the major uh, challenges is how do you build a next level uh, portal with really slick UX, you know, really, really tight user experience, great functionality, um, but not spend a fortune doing it. So that's where Haiku Theory comes in. It's not necessarily a template, right? We, it's, it's an accelerator. It's a toolkit of enhancements that we made to the Service Portal plugin, uh, several new widgets that are, are very robust and, and flexible, and you can set up a, a great service portal uh, for whatever your needs are um, in literally a day. Um, so I'm gonna just give a, a quick demo of some of the great features of this. So uh, it's a very simple user experience. We try to drive everything through the search experience and uh, the main menu navigation. So as soon as I click into search, I get suggestions of some of the most common things that I, I can access in the portal. So like reset your password, report an issue, chat, and, uh, and we've en enhanced the menu system so that you can link to just about anything. So if I click chat with us, it's gonna uh, load a, a chat queue. And uh, you can easily configure what chat queue is actually opened uh, when, you, when you click on that. Um, now let's say I actually wanna start searching. So I'm gonna search for laptop. Okay, let's search for something that has, let's say server. So what I wanna get is, Yes, yeah, so you can see in my top results here, I've got catalog items, I have knowledge articles. See these hearts over here? I can mark any of these as a favorite item. And then I can access those favorites from this favorites menu. Now, if I'm not, if I don't see what I'm looking for there, I can execute the full search results. I also get suggestions for uh, other areas that are relevant to the search term where I might want to search. Um, so we made some major improvements to the search experience. It's very robust and um, uh, almost everything a user could possibly want would be right there in the search. Otherwise we have this main menu. Uh, so this is a very mobile friendly main menu uh, where you can navigate top levels of services or, or service desks, right? So you can very easily do a unified service portal with different departments in here. Um, all of these links, they can be dynamic, or they can be static. You can link to just about anything. A good example is you can link to a, a landing page. So this is a new concept that we built um, where you can define different um, landing pages for, for services or departments. So for example, human resources, they can have their own home page within your portal uh, where they have some branding and a welcome message. They can maintain uh, menus that are specific to the HR area, have your most popular content here. Um, let's take a quick look at my tickets. So this, this format here is a pattern that we use for all the content lists in the site. So whether you do a search or you're browsing my tickets, you've got your content on the right, and then you've got some pretty robust filtering happening on the left. And these filters are very easy to maintain. You don't have to code for them. Um, and uh, they're Angular-based filters, so it's super easy, super fast. Um, sorting, uh, you can define uh, what fields to filter on. That looks uh, really good. Yeah, thank you. And um, and then like one other thing I want to show you is just the, the rest of this favorites. So this favorites widget that I'm about to show you, this actually would be a good thing to put right on your home homepage. Uh, so the favorites that the user has marked, uh, they can access them all here. Uh, if they want to change the order, you can just drag and drop them around. So we implemented drag and drop. That's a, I'm actually going to be uh, demoing how to build this favorites system in, a, uh, in the ServiceNow Ask the Expert session next month. So if you're interested in seeing how to use drag and drop and, and how to you know, do some different techniques using directives and things uh, like, for example, how to uh, get, how to implement these little hearts everywhere you see content and allow the user to um, to select them and, and deselect them. I will be demoing some of those techniques in that session. So please join me next month. I believe it's August 9th. Um, we'll get that published out though, so you'll be sure 
to know when that is. Uh, but the great thing about Haiku Theory is it's a very, very affordable solution. Um, much more affordable than you would believe it to be. Uh, once you buy it, you own the code. You don't have to keep licensing it from us. You can either use it as is to set up a portal in, in a day, or you can use it as a, a launching pad to build something even greater. Um, so let us know if you'd like a more in-depth demo of IP Theory to see what it could do for you. Um, and we would be happy to, to do that for you. Yeah, well, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists for your uh, expert discussion. I think that, uh, um, again, this was something that was a little bit new for us, but I think that uh, hopefully we were able to provide value for you and really kind of show you uh, a lot more about what you can be doing in Service Portal and, and how to approach the subject. Um, if you want to know more about Haiku Theory, there's actually a handout right now in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. If you go to the handouts and open that up, you should see a PDF with some promotional material there. Otherwise, uh, as Jeff said, he has a uh, Service House sponsored event we'll be letting everyone know about. So keep your eye out there uh, for when that page is posted. Um, that we'll be going into a little bit more detail for that as well. Um, if you guys have any other questions or want to get in touch with us uh, for any reason whatsoever, feel free to contact us on CernaSolutions.com or the information on the screen here. Uh, you can also go to any of our socials, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, to make sure you don't miss any of the events we have coming up and make sure to subscribe there. And uh, everyone, thank you guys for the discussion. I very much enjoyed it. I hope you guys did too. Uh, Tanner, Will, Jeff, thank you for joining us. And I uh, hope you guys Thanks, have a It's a lot of fun. Let's Thanks, everybody. See you All next right. time. Bye, everybody.